Shabbat Shalom. Baruch Haba, welcome. Chatzoreim Tovim, Tzahoreim Tovim, good afternoon. We welcome you to Harlingen Messianic Synagogue, to our teaching ministry. And this morning we are in Breshit, Genesis, and we're chapter 1, and we're moving on. We're making progress. Verse 2. Okay, what the way we are teaching is uh, teaching uh, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse. Um, uh, we, we slowed it down. We're not following the parasha. Um, we are following, uh, we're, we're slowing it down so that we can take a deep look um, at what is going on in the scripture. So Genesis chapter 1, and uh, we'll... we'll just uh, we, we will read with you verse 1 and verse 2. Breshit bara elokim et kashamayim ve et kaaretz ve haita ve kaaretz haita tohu ve bohu ve koshek al pne tahom ve roach elokim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters. Avinu Makhenu, our Father, our King, we love you. We thank you for loving us, for watching over us. Father, for seeing us safely through this week, for bringing us together to worship you. Father, to study your word together. We ask that you would bless us, all of us, as one with the light of your face. For with the light of your face, you have given us the Torah of life, the love of kindness and mercy. And Father, so we ask that you would teach us your way, that we might better serve you, Father, better understand you, have a better relationship with you. And so bless us now. May the words of my mouth, and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Through the merit of Yeshua Mashiach, the Imru. Amen. And so, this morning, we're going to talk about Tohu ve Bohu. Everyone say, Tohu ve Bohu. Okay, a little rhyme there. Tohu ve Bohu. Tohu, say it. Tohu ve Bohu. Tohu ve Bohu. And those two words mean without form and void. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to us? And why is God sharing this with us? So the first thing to understand is this. Um, the, 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 I'm sorry, without notes again, so I'm trying to go through my, my catalog up here and pull out the right card. Um, so what the chasal, what the sages teach us is that when God creates, and so we have a word, uh, that says haita, haita, everyone say haita. And that is that, that, uh, was without, that it was without. What it does not say is it became. That the earth was without form. Haita. It was. So I'm sure you've all heard the different creation stories. And really, it, it came out really prominently in the 60s and the 70s, but it, it actually dates much further back than that. That there's a story that, that God had created already. That God had created the, the heavens and the earth. And that that creation went bust. And that there was another Adam and another Chava. There were other people that God had created. And this whole creation went bust. They just they blew it big time. And this all ties in with the story of the flood and the Nephilim and all of these kinds of things. And so that's why that the earth is this way, that the earth is in this chaos, is very chaotic. 
because there was this other created the this other earth and it fell and so basically this is like so he does it he, he gets a, a mulligan he does a do over with adam and chava strike 2 strike 2 so why am i telling you this i'm telling you this because that is not what the hebrew says the Hebrew does not give us room for that. Because the Hebrew says that it was, that it existed, not that it became. It's not that the earth became void. The earth was created void. It's not that the earth became without form. It was created without form. And in a couple of weeks, you will see why. When God says, let there be light. In fact, that word, haita, everyone say haita, means that it was without form and void. But it also means that it fell out as form and void. Haita means to fall out, that it fell out. So, what if creation starts as a point of light which quickly expands to become the universe. And out of this light, because we're going to find out in a couple of weeks that everything is made of light. Everything. You are made of light. The chair you're sitting on is made of light. This room is made of light. Need I prove it to you? E equals mc squared. Einstein's theory of relativity. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared saying light is matter speeded up. Light is matter speeded up. Matter is light slowed down. Everything is made of light. You are created from atomic material. You are created from atomic material. Now, we're not going to get into this in depth today because we have to lay some other foundations first, but this is coming. We are, in fact, light beings. We are made of light. And some of the things that we're going to find out, because if you remember, I told you that there are some really cool things that to be discovered in the creation story. The children get their creation story, the plain, simple meaning of the text. You get the salt level, uncovering the mysteries that are hidden within the text. And so... One of the things that we're going to get into is what is real and what is not real. Is this reality real? The chair that you're sitting on, you think you're sitting on it. Is it real? Did you know that the chair that you're sitting on, though it feels solid to you, is actually 
much more space than solid material. Because it is made up of molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms, and atoms are filled with space with only tiny particles. And it is only as those atoms slow down that the particles become more dense. As they speed up, as those molecules speed up, i.e. heat is applied, they begin to move faster. They become much more fluid. So we're going to we're going to in the next few weeks get into all kinds of cool stuff about what you're made of, what this earth is made of, what the things that you possess are made of. All of this, it, it's gonna, it, a lot of it is mind blowing. But saying all of that to explain to you that when God creates light, haita. The earth falls out. And you've all heard this before, just not from a biblical perspective. That this light beam goes shooting out, and as it does, as the earth gets further away from the source of the light, it falls out. As it falls out, light is heat. Light is hot. So as the earth falls out, it begins to cool. It begins to cool. Some of the things that I'm going to share with you you would think that these things were re recent history in physics and quantum physics, that these things are recent discoveries. I'm going to share with you some things that are some teachings from our sages, from the Chassal, that are over a thousand years old. And there are some things that are 2,000 years old that go all the way back to the days of Yeshua. The Jewish sages talking about these things. One of the things that the sages bring forth is that in Genesis 1 1, Vereshit bara Elohim et Chashamayim Karitz. By the way, there's a 2,000 year old discussion over which was created first, the heavens or the earth. The house of Shemai. Now, so we're, you understand we're talking, all, we're going all the way back to pre Yeshua days, the house of Shemai. These are the Prushim, the Pharisees, the house of Shemai said that the heavens came first. Because Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But the house of Hillel, because if you know anything about the house of Shemai and the house of Hillel, if the house of Shemai said this, the house of Hillel would say that. If the house of Hillel said this, then the house of Shemai would say that. They were almost always in opposition to each other. Of course, the same was true with Rashi and Nachmanides. If, not, if Rashi said this, Nachmanides would oppose him. If Nachmanides said this, then Rashi would oppose him. Getting you to understand that Judaism is not this, this cohesive, everybody believes everything the same. There are differences and distinctions in Judaism as well as in, in because we're human beings. So not everybody agrees on everything. In fact, you know the old saying, get, uh, get, get two Jews together and you'll have three decisions, you'll have three answers. Because we can't even agree with ourselves. 
So there was the de- this debate over was heavens created first or the earth or was the earth because there are verses that say the earth first and then the heavens. And so about 200 years after that debate, one of the sages wrote, one of the rabbis wrote, I can't believe that our fathers were arguing about this. Did the heavens come first and the earth or did the earth come first and then the heavens? He said, it's like a pot and a pan. What difference does it make? You need both to exist. We need both the heavens and the earth to exist. But one of the things that we are taught by the sages is this, that when Chashamayim, when the heavens were created, they were created in their finished form. Heaven the celestial heaven is in its finished form. Where the malachim, where the angels exist, it's all, it was already finished. It was finished as soon as it's created. It's created in its finished form. However, the earth is not. The earth is created without form and void. Saying, the husband, the groom, is going to marry his bride. And so if you know the Jewish customs of marriage, that the groom would first have to build a house for his bride. And this is based on this precept that Mashiach is the groom and the Ruach, the spirit, the Shekhinah, is the bride. And so the Mashiach is building a house for his bride. And those of you who have done some of the Tree of Life with me, you'll remember that Machut, the kingdom, is the domain of Shekhinah, of the bride. Saying this earth, and we're going to see this next week, this earth is the domain of the spirit. Because this earth is the kingdom. And the kingdom is the domain of the Shekhinah. And the Shekhinah is the bride. You say, but I thought I was the bride. We were the bride. Because you are the temple of the spirit who dwells in you. Do you remember those words? You are the bride in that the Shekhinah, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Rakha Kodesh, lives within you. That's what makes you the Spirit. Or excuse me, that's what makes you the bride. And so, Machut, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. You remember those parables. That's the domain. That's the residence, the dwelling place of the Shekhinah, of the bride. So Mashiach is preparing a place for his bride, the Shekhinah. But when you go to build a house, the house isn't already built. You don't twinkle your nose, wiggle your nose, and abracadabra, and poof, there's the house all built. You wish. What do you do? It comes in piece by piece, part by part. First, they come bring in the concrete. The, the the foundation has to be dug and and the rebar has to be laid out and the concrete poured in and then the lumber's delivered and the 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 roofing is delivered and the siding is delivered, the sheetrock is delivered, everything's delivered, and there it is all piled up out there on the property. 
that is tohu. Saying, your house in essence is there. It just needs to be put together. Idea, right? It just needs to be put together. That's tohu, and so that's the earth. When the earth falls out, when the earth comes into being, it comes into being tohu. What the, now, what does this tohu mean? Tohu vibohu. Tohu means this, that all of the elements, all of the elements are there. They're just not formed into their cohesive bonds. It's like when you look out into space and you see the nebulae, the clusters made up of gas and dust, all kinds of molecules and atoms. That's tohu. There's no form to it. They're just there existing. All the building materials for the planet are there swirling around. But there's no form to it. That is tohu. And what can live in such a place? What can exist in such a place? That is bohu, where nothing can exist because there's no form. You cannot dwell in a house that does not exist. Even if all of the material for that house are together, the house is there, it's just not put together. But you can't live there until the house is put together. And so what we have here, and the earth was without form and void, vecha'aretz, haita, tohu vebohu. That the earth, that the makings of the earth are there, but the earth has not come together. It's just a massive swirl of gas and dust and fire and heat. And physics tells us that this is the way they can see planets and stars and such being formed today, that this is the way it is. They see it happening today. Now, the issue, one of the issues is this, because they will tell us that it took millions upon billions of years for the earth to form. And yet, we know that the creation took, takes place in what? Six days. Except, and so there's this, there's this big debate between evolutionists and creationists. Who's right? And so you know Judaism says what? Who's right? Yes. It doesn't have to be this or that. It can be both. In Judaism, we are taught that two things that seem to be in opposition to each other can be true at the same time. That's what makes him God. 
That's what makes him God. Saying that is it millions, billions of years, or is it a day? The answer is yes. And you say, well, how can this be? Very simple. The principles of light. Remember, everything is created out of light. Everything is created out of light. And we know that when an object speeds up, the faster an object goes, the slower time becomes. The slower an object goes, the faster time becomes. This is a law of physics. So that as you approach the speed of light, time, when you hit the speed of light, time stops. If you are to go faster than the speed of light, time begins to reverse. This is a law of physics discovered by Einstein and his principles, his theories of relativity. Therefore, something that is traveling faster than the speed of light, time is actually going in reverse. If you were to travel faster than the speed of light, you would actually become younger. If you are traveling at the speed of light, time stands still. The slower you go, the faster time is. We are now moving very slowly. And so time appears to be much longer to us. Saying that if what is making up this planet, the Earth, is traveling at the speed of light, saying what then? Because everything is first traveling at the speed of light. Saying what then? Essentially, there is no time. It's standing still. Saying that in comparison, in relationship to our present time, we're going very slowly. It would appear to be millions and billions of years. Are you grasping what I'm saying here? So that the faster that, the, that a particle, that something is traveling, the slower its time is. As it begins to solidify, then what? It can no longer travel at the speed of light. It begins to slow down. It begins as it begins to slow down because everything has gravity to it. You have gravity to you. It's just that your gravity is less than the gravity of the planet because the greater something is, the more of a gravitational pull it has, the more gravitational energy it has. So the Earth has tremendous gravitational energy. The moon has much less. This is why if you want to be a basketball player, you need to play on the moon. You can jump much higher. But you will still fall back down to the moon. There is a gravitational pull to it. The gravitational force of the sun is immense, so immense that it has caught all of this solar system into its gravitational pull. The reason why we don't fall into the sun is centrifugal force, that the power of our rotation around the sun is an equilibrium against the gravitational pull of the sun. If we were to stop moving, we would be pulled into the sun. So that as the earth is falling out, as what is making up this tohu is 
shooting through with the light as it begins to condense it becomes slower and it takes on a gravitational pull of its own pulling all of the particles condensing everything within itself now mind you what i was telling you and this is why i Sorry, I don't have my computer because I could quote you directly from the sages from a thousand years ago, not the 1920s when Einstein was developing all this theory. Einstein, Einstein was a Jew. And he was taught Kabbalah. These are actually Kabbalistic principles from sages, from rabbis who lived many hundred years before Einstein existed. They were teaching what we know today as modern physics a thousand years ago. The first great physics scientist was, I forgot his name, Theory of Gravity, I mean the, Newton, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. He was the first great physicist. He wasn't Jewish. He was a devout Christian. And he wasn't looking for the laws of physics. He was actually trying to determine when the Messiah was going to return. And he was using his, because he was a mathematician, he was using his mathematical calculations to try to determine when the Messiah would return. By the way, the, day, the, the time that he came up with, he said, if Messiah does not come before 2050, 2050 he would be coming late. You realize we're in 2023. This was 300, 400 years ago that he was determining this. You see what's going on around us. How did Sir Isaac Newton come upon his, his calculations? Kabbalah. He studied the Jewish sages. He studied Zohar. And Einstein, Albert Einstein, built on the principles of Sir Isaac Newton, also a Kabbalist. And all of modern physics and quantum physics are based upon these principles, which are Kabbalistic principles. Are they real? Do you have internet? Do you have internet? That's physics. This phone, this Android, physics. The, the power that is within this Android is more than the power that I had in my first computer in the early 1990s. And the speed is 10,000 times faster. And it's all physics, and it's all based on Einstein, which is based on Newton, which is based on Kabbalah. So, what the sages taught us is that um, hang on just a second. 
that the Sadia Gaon, one of the great rabbis from almost a thousand years ago, that this word tohu means that everything is unformed. That everything is unformed. Um, hang on. So that all of the, so that all of the, um, all of the elements are there, but they're not cohesive. They're not together. There is no dirt. There is no earth. There is none of these things. It's all in a chaotic. Uh, uh, the Chizkuni uh, says that the earth has been in this is in a chaotic state. That everything is that everything is a mass and a jumble. That there's nothing that is cohesive. So the 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 uh, Hamech Davar says this: the name rests on something that is not distinguished or differentiated from anything else. So, in other words, looking at the earth in this state, in this form, you can't distinguish between this and that. For example, we've all seen the the pictures of the earth from like the moon and from you know the spacecraft and all. And you can see where the water is, and you can see where the land is. You can see the water mass. You can see the land mass. You can see the ice caps. You can distinguish. You can see the clouds. But in this form of tohu, you, can, you, can dist- you can't distinguish anything. It's like when we look at Jupiter from here. What does Jupiter look like from Earth? Even with our even with our satellites and even with our with our uh, optics with with the, not binoculars our telescopes and things like that, what does Jupiter look like? What does Saturn look like to us? Can you make any distinguishments, or is everything just a big jumble? They look like giant marbles. Neil brought me a marble last night, and he was playing with it. And he said, "Look, Gram- look, Grandpa, I got a marble, and it was one of those, uh, you know, that that's got all the colors all swirled in and mixed in. It looks like, and that's the way Jupiter looks from here on the Earth with our telescope. You can't distinguish. You can't tell the difference between water and land." Because it's all a big chaos. It's all chaotic. There's nothing solid about it. And it's heated. Nothing can exist. So, the gematria of Tohu is 410. So, if you take the letters that make Tohu, it equals to 410. Letters are numbers, numbers are letters. What is important about that? 410 are the years that the first temple stood. And then it was destroyed. The Bohu 
is 220 years. 400, excuse me, 420 years. 420 is the number that the second temple stood before it was destroyed. If you put the whole sentence together, it equals, you ready? 2000. It has been 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed. Tohu vebohu, the sages tell us, this means without Torah. It has been 2,000 years since the earth, but wait a minute. Yeshua is the living Torah. What happened 2,000 years ago? The living Torah walked this earth, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. They say it's been 2,000 years since the Torah. That we have been living in darkness since the destruction of the temple. Yeshua told them on that great day when he presented himself as the Messiah to all of Israel. And the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, came out and told them, told him, told the people to be quiet because they were saying, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, Baruch Haba. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he turned to the priest and he said, You will not see me again until you will say, And he turned around and he walked away. And they haven't seen him since. These 2,000 years. I want to close with a very interesting... And by the way, Rashi says that this word, tohu, it signifies... Astonishment that there is so much chaos. That you're astonished with it. You can't understand it. You can't comprehend it. You're just struck. Kind of the way when a hurricane comes through and your house that was once fine and standing and where you were living and it had all the joys and all the memories of life and suddenly this great devastating wind comes through and the roof is ripped off and everything's left in shambles. It's the way when Hamburg was bombed by the British in World War II. Where these great apartment buildings and homes and businesses. A city the size of San Antonio. almost completely demolished to where people could not even, it, was, they, it became so unrecognizable, people could not even find where their home used to be. Yeah. 
Nothing is left. Everything is ruined. Everything is destroyed. Everything's knocked down. You can't even find the street you used to live on. And the people were walking around, looking around, looking at the destruction. Now you have heard me say in our very first teaching on these subjects, on my very first teaching of Genesis, I told you, in order for you to understand the ending, you must understand first the beginning. In order for you to see and to understand what's coming, what is coming, what is coming to us, what's going to happen, you must first understand the beginning. Why? Because the ending will be as the beginning. Saying what? The sages tell us that this earth will return to a state of tohu vebohu. They tell us that there are three times in which this state occurred. The first was upon creation. The second was upon the flood of Noah, tohu vebohu. The third was upon the final destruction of the Beit HaMikdash of the temple. That the world became empty and dark. The fourth will be at the coming of Mashiach. And they tell us that the earth will return to its primordial state. That the earth is going to return to its pre-creation state due to the wickedness of mankind. Due to the wickedness of mankind, the earth will once again return to this position of tohu vibohu. Turn, if you would, to Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 3. Loved ones, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. In both, I am trying to stir you up by way of a reminder to wholesome thinking, to remember the word previously proclaimed by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your emissaries. First of all, understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing. We're there. Scoffers will come scoffing, following after their own desires and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers died, everything goes on, just as it has from the beginning of creation. For in holding to this idea, it escapes their notice that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. That's the tohu vebohu. The next ver the next section of that verse tells us that darkness covered the earth and that the spirit of God hovered over the water. 
The earth was a water world. And by the way, this is where the flood comes from. And we're going to talk about that. Because people say, well, where did all the water come from? Well, where did all the water go? If it all covered the earth, where is it now? Well, they have an answer for it. It's here. It's here. I'll just tell you, there's more water under every continent. There is so much water under every continent, under all the continents, I should say, that scientists, I just read an article on it two days ago, scientists say that it is sufficient water to cover the entire earth to turn this world back into a water world. There is sufficient water to cover the entire planet. And I mean to cover, I mean no land visible. Through these, the world of that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by the same word, the present heaven and earth are being reserved for fire, kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly people. So read that again. The same heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. What? Tohu vebohu. There it is. This earth is going to be reverted back to its primordial state. It's going to go back. Why? Because of the ungodliness that exists here. The first time he took it back to Tohu Vebohu using water, that is back to its secondary state. Because first it is Tohu Vebohu, then it becomes water. Then the, the particles settle out and the water comes up. And it's covered by water. And so for the flood, he takes it to its secondary state. But this time, he's going to take it back to its primary state of fire. Of a point where you cannot distinguish one thing from the other. Verse 8, but don't forget this one thing, loved ones, that the that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day there it is. How can a day be this long length of time? And how can this long length of time be in a day? Time stops. The closer you get to the speed of light, the slower time goes. And when one passes the speed of light, time begins to reverse. How is it that this world, that scientists look at this world and they say it's millions, billions of years old? That's how. Because relative to our position today, and the speed at which we're traveling today, time is much slower. It goes by much more slowly. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with the roar. The elements will melt and disintegrate and the earth and everything done on it shall be exposed. It's all going to melt. It's all going to go back to its original form. What is coming to this earth is we're going back to the beginning. But it is through this return to the beginning, to its primordial state, to the tohu, the bohu, that we enter Olam Kava. Because as we go back to the beginning, Creation did not stop with tohu vebohu, but what? He began to create until the end, what? You have 
Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Live your lives in holiness and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. In that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt in the intense heat. But in keeping with his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. He's going to, and the word that is used here is, Kodesh, like Rosh Kodesh, what we did today, the new month, but it's but is the moon and the new moon is the moon new? No, it just recycles. So it's not that he's going to go all the way back to uh to Ain Sof and start all over again. He's going to recycle us, recycle the earth the heavens and the earth. He's going to renew them. He's going to make them again. But the warning to us is this. And this is what we should take from this. What does Kepha, what does Peter say here? Think what is coming. How should you be living your life? As it was, so it shall be. But knowing that as it was is returning to us, so it shall be. Knowing that these are so, what manner of person ought we to be in all manner of godliness and holiness how should i be living my life this is why we are warned to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together he says as the manner of some is but rather exhorting one another and so much the more so as you see that day approaching What day? The day of God. Understand, one day you're going to have to stand before God and give an accounting, give an answer for your life. The thing about human physiology, human makeup, is that we always think we have more time than what we have. And especially if you're like me, a procrastinator. I always think that I have more time to take my shower than what I do. Thus, I'm always running late. One day, when I was in junior high, I got off the bus with my report cards. The news was not good. I had a couple of D's and an F. I did not want to see dad that afternoon. Thankfully, dad was not home when I got home. Yes. Put it off a little bit. I walked in the door of the house, and the first thing that I did was I filled up the sinks with water, with hot water, and I began to furiously wash dishes. I mean, I washed and I dried and I put away. Then I got out the broom, and I swept all through the house. I swept every room, every floor of the house. And then I got out the mops, and I mopped all the floors. And then I started polishing furniture. And I mean, I had that house spick and span when Dad got home. 
It was like a brand new house. All the dishes were done. Everything was put away. The 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 sink and all was polished, spit shine. You could eat off of the floor. I mean that house was clean. And I was literally just putting away the last, putting away the mops and such when dad walked in the door. He looked around and he said, where's your report card? With much fear and trembling, I pulled my report cards out of my back pocket. And handed it to him. He said, what's with these grades? I just stood before him. Nothing to say. Put my head down. Wouldn't look at him. Frightened, frightened, frightened to death. Because my dad was a spanker. And he used the belt. And it hurt. He left welts. And I was literally shivering in my shoes as I stood before him. He told me no after school events, no sports, and no TV for six weeks. And he turned around and walked away. What happened? I had mollified. I had softened the blow by performing well in this area on this day. I knew that judgment was coming. And so I softened the anger by doing things that he would find pleasing even though this aspect of my life would be displeasing to him, this aspect of my life was pleasing to him, and it softened the blow. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've done not so good. You've stumbled. You've fallen. But judgment's coming. And it's coming faster than you consider it. How do I soften the blow? By doing right now. Do the right thing right now. And by making this correction in my life and demonstrating to the Father that I'm serious about this, I'm serious about serving Him, it softens the blow. Because we all must stand before Him one day. And when we stand Him, we all must go through the fire. That's what Rav Shaul speaks about. That's what the Apostle Paul talks about. When we all must stand before the judgment seat of, of the Messiah and those things that we have done for, for, for him will come forth as, as gold and silver and precious stones, but those things that we have done for self will burn away as wood and hay and stubble.
So we have a stack of old lumber that I've cut up into pieces and we slowly we we slowly burned them down. Old buildings uh, that we had on the property and things like that. Uh, the kids remodeled the house when they moved in and so a lot of the old lumber and everything and so it's all stacked up and I have a fire pit there and and every once in a while I'll go out there. So uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Thursday, I went out there, filled up the fire pit, started a fire. And that fire was burning hot. What's it doing? It's getting rid. Only, only, the, only the, the carbon is left. It's getting rid of everything else. That's the ash. That's the carbon. And it does it with intense heat. So hot was the fire that I, I, I was going to put more wood on it, and the fire was, was hot. The coals were so hot. I had a stick to pick the lid up of, and, and the, it was so hot that it, it burned my, my hand, singed my, singed my hair. What I'm saying is don't think that this purification process is without its pain. When we have to stand before him and he strips us down to nothing except for what we have done that pertains to him and everything else is stripped away. How do you mollify that? How do you soften the blow? By doing something about it now, today. This is the time to live in godliness and holiness because on that day, it will be too late. You have the opportunity today to do something for the King of Kings, to make the changes in your life that need to be made because the day is coming. You know this is true. It is there before you. The day is coming when this earth will revert back to tohu vebohu, and it's not going to be a good day for humanity. The Lord is coming. His eyes flaming in anger. Blood dashed on his robe. A sword coming forth from his mouth. And hundreds and thousands of people will be destroyed in an instant. Only those who are faithful remain. You think about it. Is today's pleasure? Worth it in the end. Is the momentary pleasure the immediate gratification worth it in the end? Papa's coming. One of the things that we used to do 
we had what it was called what is called a story and a half farmhouse. Had a downstairs, the upstairs, the upstairs, the room follows the slope of the roof. So over in the corners, it's only about four feet tall, and then up in the roof, it's about ten feet tall. Up in the middle. And had an alcove that looked out to the east, and the east is the direction that mom and dad would come. They would come down a, a blacktop highway and then onto the dirt road. It was a dirt, We re- lived on a dirt road, and so they would come down the blacktop highway and then out onto the dirt road. So, And there was hardly anybody else that lived out there, so you could actually see mom, sev- mom and dad coming home several miles away. And so... Certain ones of us would be appointed to be the lookouts because mom and dad would always give us a list of chores to do before they got home. And so there would be certain ones of us who would serve as lookouts and we're supposed to be looking out and we're looking from this alcove up on the second floor, looking out. We could see for for several miles watching for that car to appear. Because that would give us approximately two, three minutes, four, to try to catch up on all the chores and at least get something done. So inevitably, the cry would go out, here they come. And it became a frantic mad dash. Before that, it was playing around and playing around. But you know, the longer the, longer the time took, the closer we knew the timing of his coming was, correct? Until inevitably the cry goes up, here they come. And now it's the mad dash. Whatever isn't done, get it done. And do it quickly. And all hands on deck, everybody, everybody involved. And when they come in, they would they would inspect. Dad would walk through the house. And he would note the things that had been done, and he would note the things that had not been done. One of his favorite tricks was to put a dollar bill under the sofa. Why? Well, if you didn't sweep there, you didn't find it. But if you swept there, you got to keep that dollar bill. He didn't do it every time, but he did it sometimes, often enough to where we learned to sweep under the sofa frequently. He comes and his reward is with him. For those who have done good, he brings goodness. For those who have done evil, he brings judgment. So the warning for us today is this. Everything that's going on in the world, everything that you hear, all the things that you see, what's going on with Israel today, all of the protests, all the hatred against Jews and against Israel, all of these things that you're seeing, these are all hints telling you time is running out, time is running out, time is running out, time is running out. You're running out of time. Isaac Newton said, if Mashiach returned by 2050, he would be late, according to his calculations. Look at what you're seeing going on. We're there. We are there. I'm not saying he's coming today or tomorrow. He may. I'm not saying he's coming today or tomorrow. I'm saying we're there. We're at the end. He's giving you all the signs he foretold. Everything he's talked about, it's coming true. Right before your eyes. You're watching prophecy come to to pass right before your eyes. What then? Are you going to be one of the ten virgins? Are you going to be five the five virgins who whose lamps were filled with oil and they were prepared for the coming of the groom? Or are you going to be the five who didn't care? Didn't care enough until it was too late, and then you're left out.
you best take care and take care that you're being careful in how you're living your life. The things that you're neglecting, the things that you are allowing it to come in. Because as it was in the beginning, so it is going to be at the end. The day of judgment is coming. And this world will return to the state of tohu vebohu. And how you stand with God determines whether you make it through that hour or you do not. Adina Makeno, our Father, our King, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for watching over us, Lord. We thank you for your word, which teaches us, corrects us, guides us. Father, we pray that you would help us to live for you every moment, every day. That we would live for you because you're coming back to judge, to weigh us, to put us in the balance, to see how we measure up. And so we ask that you would help us to live for you, to be godly, to be holy in every aspect of our lives, to follow your word, to do what we're commanded to do and to not do what we're commanded not to do. That when you come, you would find us as a people in service to you. Give us strength. Give us courage. We ask these things through the merit of Yeshua Mashiach. Let us stand for the blessing, please. <laughs>